I'm Neil Patterson. Welcome to the Sky News Daily. Today we are focusing very much on the Middle East and very specifically the border between Israel and Lebanon. Now there have been long-standing tensions and skirmishes between the two for many, many years. Recently though, we have seen three days of Israeli aerial bombardment aimed at diminishing the militia group Hezbollah. Meanwhile, of course, Israel's war on Hamas continues. Hamas, like Hezbollah, backed by the Iranian state. And the fear is pretty obvious. All-out war in the region, and one which you could see uh, dragging in players like the United States or even the United Kingdom. Therefore, as you would expect, huge diplomatic efforts are underway to avoid this. A little later, however, we will be reflecting on what war might look like if it takes place. With our defence editor, Deborah Haynes, she'll be speaking to us from Tel Aviv. But let's start in New York at the United Nations meeting, obviously discussing the situation in the Middle East. Our international affairs editor, Dominic Wacon, uh, joins us. Uh, Dominic, really good to see you. So much mention of Hezbollah at the moment for, for obvious reasons. Just explain exactly who they are, because this is a, a Lebanon-based organisation, but it has its origins in the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran. It does. You're right. Yeah. I mean, it's very confusing, as always, with the Middle East. And you have the various different organizations and it's often confused with Hamas. So Hamas is the Palestinian uh, Islamist organization uh, based in Gaza, but also pretty active in the West Bank, uh, the occupied Palestinian territories and uh, with whom Israel has been fighting. Hezbollah is different. Hezbollah is Lebanese and Shiite. And to go back to its origins, really, you have to go back to 1982. In 1982, Israel and the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, that most people will, will remember was uh, headed by Yasser Arafat. They were exchanging far, rather similar to what's happening now over Israel's uh, northern border. The PLO was fighting with the Israelis uh, and the Israelis then invaded Lebanon all the way up to Beirut and fought it out with the PLO who then went into exile and fled to uh, Tunisia. But Israel did not withdraw completely from Lebanon. In fact, they stayed occupying southern Lebanon until the year 2000. And in that time, Hezbollah emerged uh, and got stronger and stronger. So up to that point, the members of Hezbollah were basically farmers in the poor south uh, of Lebanon. And they were transformed to this very, what has become a formidable uh, and very effective uh, militant organization that is supported by Iran and uh, supplied weapons by Iran and funded by Iran. And uh, in those years, uh, they have effectively become an organization that has carried out any number of terrorist attacks against the Americans in Beirut. One barracks bombing that you'll remember killed more than 300 uh, and they've been blamed for attacks around the world as well. So Israel's critics say they're actually sort of responsible for the fact that Hezbollah was created because had they not invaded Lebanon, had they not occupied it for so long, Hezbollah would not have sprung up and, and set itself up as what it claims to be, which is a anti-Israeli occupation originally and then anti-Israeli now resistance organisation. And what Hezbollah say to the Lebanese is that they are there to protect Lebanon and the Lebanese from Israel and they've become a state within a state because they are so powerful and so well funded. Ser serving as they do though, as a proxy of the Iranian state, does, does Hezbollah have an ideology to speak of? Does it have a stated set of ambitions beyond the advancement of Iranian strategic uh, priorities? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, Hezbollah means party of, of God uh, and it is both a military organisation a terrorist organisation. It's been condemned and prescribed as such by America and Britain and other Western nations. But it is also a political party and it plays a political role uh, in the politics of Lebanon, which is very, very fractured and uh, very dysfunctional. So it is very much committed to the Iranian Islamic revolution that uh, happened in 1979. And the Iranians are committed to spreading their form of Islamism uh, around the region. They are opposed to the existence of Israel and Hezbollah is effectively a kind of theological arm and sort of branch of that revolution. So they, I guess they've got a kind of ideologically, they have a sort of dual function in terms of how they present themselves to the Lebanese, but also how they act uh, on behalf of their Iranian patrons. And, and, and to an extent, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it does appear to me that Hezbollah have, have, have quite an obvious leadership as well in Syed Hassan Nasrallah. I mean, how much do we know about him? Yeah, so he's someone who was actually a military commander in the south, uh, and he has seen a lot of his commanders uh, killed and assassinated uh, in recent days and weeks. So he's now 
he's having to replace the chief of staff. He's having to replace the head of the rockets brigade because all these commanders have been uh, killed. But he does retain that military ability. He's also an extremely effective orator uh, and, and leader and, and preacher. And since 2006, he's led a subterranean existence. He was forced into hiding because the Israelis would like to kill him. So he lives in a bunker, assumed to be somewhere underneath Dahia, that's the Hezbollah stronghold in Beirut. Some people think he may have left Beirut for his own safety. And from that bunker, over, you know, over the years, he has appeared on huge video screens. So I went to one speech he gave in a big stadium in southern Beirut, where the faithful are gathered in their thousands, rather like a rock star, his, sort of, his image appears on a very big screen. And he delivers a, a lengthy speech which sort of begins quite calmly and then he sort of builds up into a very fiery oration that, that gets his, the masses fired up. And I think the big question about Nasrallah at the moment is, is he going to continue doing Iran's bidding or, or is he going to start using this massive arsenal of firepower that the Iranians effectively have paid for and supplied for Hezbollah to hide in the hills of southern Lebanon, but also in the Bekaa Valley? And the conventional wisdom is that Iran wants to, uh, that arsenal to remain as insurance policy for the day when Israel attacks its nuclear facilities. And it does not want to squander that, even though it's been provoked to the extreme by Israel at the moment. And I think the question now is, if Israel kills enough Lebanese civilians, will Nasrallah feel he has to do his duty? Will he have to follow through on that promise to the Lebanese to protect them and start using much many more of these missiles? Because terrible though it is at the moment, this exchange of fire is effectively a kind of shadow war presaging something that could be a lot worse. And if those missiles are used uh, mm -hmm. against Israel, thousands of them, then you could see a much bigger regional uh, conflict engulfing the Middle East. Well, let's talk then about a point tangential to the place that you are, the, the United Nations. The diplomatic efforts that will be ongoing right now as we speak mid-afternoon British time on, on, on Thursday afternoon. Look, is this an organisation that we can engage with diplomatically? Is this an organisation that we have any open form of communication with countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, institutions like the United Nations? Well, it's funny, I was, I was putting that point to an American diplomat yesterday, and you know, he was saying that they're engaged in, a, in an intense effort to bring about a diplomatic solution to this conflict. Uh, and I said, but you can't do that with, with Hezbollah directly. But he says, we do have ways of bringing pressure to bear indirectly on both Hezbollah and Iran. And that's obviously through regional partners, and so Arab countries, uh, but other countries that have diplomatic channels with Iran, who are Hezbollah's uh, patrons. So Britain, of course, has an embassy in Iran with a pretty checkered uh, history of, of being surrounded and, and attacked from time to time by the Iranians, but it's, we still have diplomatic relations with Iran. And what's interesting, Neil, is over the, overnight, uh, in the wake of really dire, apocalyptic mood in the UN Security Council, there was a sense of optimism. The Americans leading the way, they and G7 partners and, and Arab countries, saying that they felt a ceasefire was being put together. And then the Americans went as far as saying that it would be implemented, they believed, in the coming hours. What we've heard from Israel since is that uh, that has led to a lot of anger amongst the Israelis, but at the highest levels of government as well. They believe that they've got the advantage, they've got Hezbollah where they want them and they want to press home that advantage. And they've said there will be no ceasefire for now. So, look, look whilst those, those, those efforts are continuing, I mean... <sighs> Surely all-out war in the region is in with, within the gift of, of one state, that state being the Islamic Republic of Iran. As of this moment, Dom, in, their, in terms of their medium to long-term ambitions, would all-out conflict in the region truly serve the desires of those running Iran right now? No, the answer to that is no. But, you know, when you look at the Middle East, it seems a very chaotic place and very unpredictable. But there are basic rules and sort of fundamental assumptions that we that we generally use to kind of predict where events are going. Now, one of those assumptions is that Iran does not want to allow this arsenal of uh, formidable, awesome firepower of 150 odd thousand missiles to be used against Israel, except for the moment when Israel attacks its nuclear alleged nuclear weapons program. And, and ever since October the 7th, the, that, that assumption has been proven to be true because there have been a number of points where the Iranians could have allowed that to happen. They could have allowed Hezbollah to get involved in a much more hostile way in the fight uh, with Israel, and that hasn't happened. But I think what could change is a number of things. One could be that that 
civilian death toll becomes so high that Israel kills so many civilians. And it is going after now that these sort of longer range missiles, which are buried deep in the Be Bekar Valley, away from the south of Lebanon as well. And all of that could increase the risk of a much bigger civilian death toll. And at some point, the Iranians may feel, and Hezbollah may feel, that they have no alternative but to fight back with a lot more firepower. Mm -hmm. I think the other change in that equation could be if Iran believes that the insurance policy that is Hezbollah is fatally compromised. If they think that Hezbollah is just going to be completely destroyed and dismantled, and we're not anywhere near that yet, but the Israelis are certainly having a good go at it, then the Iranians might believe they've got to get, a, get involved to safeguard their insurance policy. So, you know, I think these assumptions remain true until events challenge them and change them fundamentally. And we're certainly moving in that direction yet, but I think at the moment still, Tehran, the Mullahs in Tehran, the Ayatollahs, they want to hold on to that arsenal. They don't want it squandered. And, and I think confirmation of that came from the Iranian president, Masoud Pezeshkian, when he gave a more conciliatory tone. He, he wasn't urging Hezbollah to do its worst when he was speaking to reporters here earlier in the week. Uh, and he talked about Israel laying traps. And clearly, the Iranians at the moment don't want to fall into a trap. And one of those traps would clearly be being so provoked that they unleash that uh, arsenal of firepower. Uh, Israel then destroys it and the Iranians have nothing left to fight back if Israel then at some point attacks Iran uh, within its own borders. Dominic, thanks very much. And of course, that remains the hope that all out conflict can be avoided. Next, however, we'll speak to our defence editor. If war is coming, what will it look like? Back soon. Welcome back. Look, there can be precious few in the region who truly want all-out conflict. But as we have seen time and again in the Middle East, the momentum towards war can sometimes be irresistible. Our uh, Defence and Security Editor, Deborah Haynes, is joining us from uh, Tel Aviv. Good to see you, Deborah. Look, b before we get into what may well come next, in fact, to, to what extent have the Israelis already diminished Hezbollah as a, as a fighting force? Well, this operation, which began just over a week ago, has been, from an Israeli perspective, incredibly effective. You'll remember with those pager and walkie-talkie explosions that were in the hands of a lot of Hezbollah members. And a Reuters report in the last couple of days uh, claimed that 1,500 fighters were actually maimed in those explosions. Now, that's not confirmed, but that is a significant number. However, it's important to remember that when you actually look at the size of Hezbollah, it's, it's a huge paramilitary force. Uh, exact numbers aren't known, but uh, a report to the US Congress put the figure at about 40 to 50,000 fighters. Uh, other claims are that it's even bigger than that. But also with this Israeli offensive, after the pager and walkie-talkie strikes, they began the, the biggest air offensive against Hezbollah since the 2006 war. And that has taken out a number of key commanders. Yes, they are being replaced, but when it comes to commanding the, uh, the military operation on the ground, you want to have experience. So that seems to be the, the Israeli tactic to go after the commanders too. So, so their capabilities have, have definitely been degraded. But we should make absolutely clear, Hezbollah is not some ragtag group of mercenaries living out in the desert. I mean, this is an effective force. Yes, it's been armed and equipped by Iran and trained as well. Uh, and it is you know, more powerful than the Lebanese official armed forces. And in terms of its actual weapons arsenal, yes, the Israelis have been striking against weapons, stores, stockpiles, launches. But in terms of the numbers of short, medium and longer range missiles and rockets uh, from the Israeli side, they believe it's, you know, it's over 100,000, maybe as many as 200,000 of these missiles. So while the numbers that they're saying that they've hit, you know, sort of thousands of different munitions taken out, there are many, many more stockpiles kept in um, place across the country. And that is why any further escalation in this conflict, if Hezbollah, for example, were to unleash much more of its weapons arsenal, uh, then it would be 
very, very difficult, impossible, uh, actually, for Israel to be able to defend against all of them. So it, it would pay a price. And that's the calculation. Does it believe that that is a, a price worth playing for escalating this conflict even further? Well, let's, let's just conduct a, a thought experiment. And one, let's be honest, which we really hope does not come to fruition. If this conflict continues to escalate in the manner in which we've been seeing, what would war between Israel and Hezbollah look like? We've, we've seen the airstrikes. We assume a ground offensive would follow. And, and frankly, as we have already seen in Gaza, that can be incredibly bloody. There's obviously lots of different potential scenarios for how a full-scale war would unfold. And clearly, that's why you're seeing all these, these efforts at diplomacy to try to pull both sides back from the brink. But if if we are sort of thinking hypothetically what it could look like, were the, the obvious next progression to happen, which would be some kind of land incursion, then it really depends upon the scale of that. It's stated that its aim is to create this buffer zone along its border in the north and um, to push Hezbollah fighters back beyond the Latani River, which was meant to be the line that had been agreed back in 2006 when there was a UN Security Council resolution following the last war. There's, there was supposed to be a, effectively a demilitarized area where there would be no weapons, no fighters, and then no strikes by Hezbollah into Israeli territory. Um, if Israel believes that that could be achieved just by having a limited ground incursion where its troops would only enter just slightly across the border, maybe in limited numbers, to target those weapon sites and to try to clear that area, then, you know, obviously that would, that, that raises uh, the risk of further escalation. Clearly, there will be fighting on the ground, you'd expect, as Hezbollah tried to push them back. But it's not clear whether either side would be able to achieve their goals. So then it raises the possibility of a much more aggressive ground incursion, which would involve much larger numbers of troops spreading out across the country, pushing towards Beirut. But that is what was attempted back in 2006, and it did not end well. Um, there was not success, as the Israelis would see it, and they were forced to push back. And so the actual action in terms of the offensive on the ground would be bloody and very difficult because, like you were saying, Hezbollah is a significant fighting force. Israel, too, of course, it's the most it has the most powerful military in this region, but it's a military that's been at war in Gaza for almost a year now. And so its troops will be tired and they will have limited reserves. Despite, despite their forces being pretty tired after a year-long campaign in Gaza, Deborah, you're going to have to explain to me why, when Israel possesses overwhelming air superiority, overwhelming ground superiority, they've certainly got the edge when it comes to intelligence, this is not a conflict that they could win in days. I mean, it just underlines the difficulty when you're dealing with an unconventional force. This isn't a state-on-state -state operation. Just look at what happened in Afghanistan when the United States, the most powerful military in the world, was not able to defeat the Taliban during more than two decades of conflict. You know, in, in this case with Hezbollah, it's integrated very much with the community, with, um, with civilians. It makes it very, very difficult to defeat in military means alone. And I think that is a massive problem here. You're already seeing growing condemnation of the civilian death toll inside Lebanon. I'm just wondering, from your place in Tel Aviv, in Israel, to what extent is Israel's military action on Hezbollah in the north of the country directly linked to the political problems that Benjamin Netanyahu has at the top of this government at the moment? I mean, he's uh, under huge criticism, huge pressure about the way that he has led the campaign against Hamas in Gaza and the failure to secure the release of all of the hostages. The impact of the October the 7th attack on Israel can't be underestimated in terms of undermining that impression amongst Israeli civilians that they could rely on their military and their intelligence services to protect them. 
That has underpinned everything that's happened since. There was restraint on the Israeli side because they knew just how potentially impossible it would be to successfully conduct two operations on two fronts at a large scale. But over time, there's clearly been in the back of the mind of the Israeli military and politicians this need to restore deterrence, to restore their reputation as a power that can't be messed with in a region where, let's face it, they're surrounded by neighbours who want them to be obliterated. And for the very latest on what's happening right now in the Middle East, just head to skynews.com. That's your lot for this edition of The Daily. However, we're back again tomorrow. 